Paul is doing something here to basically set the stage for the Holy Spirit and its operation and understanding the Spirit of God in your life and the availability of the Spirit of God in your life. And basically, what he does, he renounces all of his previous learning. He renounces all of his previous experiences. And he renounces. He doesn't give any of that uh, any credit for what is now taking place in his relationship with God, in his ministry, and in his walk with God. Now, that's important. Now, he is probably... Uh, up to this point, one of the most, uh, one of the greatest geniuses that we see in the Bible. You had Solomon, uh, you had Jesus, now you have the Apostle Paul. Now that's not to mention that they're the only three wise men and powerful people in the Bible, but these rank up there at, at least in the top three or four or in the top five. But what he wants to do is he wants to take emphasis all of his background. Paul came from a very wealthy family. He is so wealthy, in fact, that his parents, who are Jews, they bought Roman citizenship. Now, that was advantageous. That was really God uh, moving on his parents' life, even though many people believe that they disowned him after he became a Christian and after he became a follower of Christ. It's important for you to understand that the Christian church, the New Testament church, the apostle Peter and the 12 and 11 apostles, they did not make him an apostle. They were afraid of him. They were prejudiced of him. They really felt threatened by him. And so God took care of all of that. He saved him on the road to Damascus, as you very well know. And not only did he save him, but he anointed him and he called him uh, to be an apostle to the Gentiles, to validate that calling and that anointing that fell on the apostle Paul. Uh, in Acts chapter 12, you see the closing of the door to the Jews. Peter is rescued from prison by an angel, and the angel leads him through the prison. Sixteen guards are watching him. He literally walks through four walls, quadrant of walls, out of the jail, through several gates in the inner part of the city and then the outermost gate, uh, the angel walked him to that gate and it opened up and he told him, he says, go into the world and preach all the words of this life. Everything that he had seen, heard and seen in Jesus do, keep on telling it. But that's really, that's the closing of the door of the Jews. Uh, and so all of a sudden you have 13 books coming out of the Apostle Paul and three missionary journeys that he wrote. So he, uh, he, we know he spoke five known languages. I personally believe it was way beyond that. He is a rock star when it comes to understanding the gospel. He had so many revelations from God and he gave to us probably this church, us, gave to us one of the greatest hope of our eternal glory because after all of the apostles died, and they had died off, everybody was kind of bewildered. Well, if Jesus is coming back and all of us are in the grave, how are we going to go back with him? According to John chapter 14, do not let your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. And Paul gave us the revelation. None of the other apostles understood how exactly God was going to bring us all, whether we are alive when the rapture takes place and he returns for us, or whether we die and go by the way of the grave. Paul tells us also this we know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That solved one of the greatest doctrinal theology or theological questions in the entire uh, scope of being a Christian. What happens to you when you die? For this we know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Everything about the Apostle Paul is indoctrinated that develops us and shapes us and gives us wisdom and knowledge and learn. As much as I enjoy the book of Proverbs and Psalms because they're great, meticulous one-liners that you can pull out when you're going through some things, every single book that the Apostle Paul writes 
He writes in, as a declaration to the churches which he had started through the anointing of the Holy Spirit and is giving them foundational government principles based upon the Word of God and Jesus Christ, the Word, the light, and the way, the truth, and the life. And so basically, I want to share with you some things that Paul had to eventually sideline. Anybody heard about Mars Hill and Paul going there? What happened? Anybody remember? He was very unsuccessful. Now, do you know why? Say it, Sister Lewis, also. That's it. Not once in his message on Mars Hill did he mention Jesus Christ. Not once. And he left there defeated because he tried to impress. When you step out from under the anointing and do not allow Jesus to lead you in anything that you do that you're going to call ministry, uh, you're going to get in trouble. And now that Jesus has gone and sat down at the right hand of his majesty on high and sent back the Holy Spirit, you and I cannot do anything of eternal value without the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It is the Holy Ghost that makes the difference in your life. So read with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses beginning at verse 1. It says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with an excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. He learned his lesson. In fact, just... When he's writing this, he had just returned from Mars Hill and he just basically just, just wanted to hide somewhere. He was embarrassed. He was ashamed. He was under conviction because he never allowed the Holy Spirit to basically lead him and instruct him in that. He wanted to be impressive. And the reason he wanted to do that is because, and there was a reason, I guess if you want to justify the flesh and the whims of the flesh, here's the reason he did that. The people on Mars Hill were considered to be some of the wisest people, most knowledgeable people on the earth at that time. And they were of the understanding or of the mind that Christians were simple people. They were ignorant people. They were no higher than fishermen, and their status would never allow them to vac you know, vacate any higher than that. They just did not have the intelligence to hold down responsibility and authority and governmental issues. So they were looked down upon as though they were ignorant. And got the Apostle Paul, he went in there and he wanted to let them know that there were exceptions to the rule. While he was right in understanding that, he was wrong in trying to showcase his knowledge and his wisdom and never allowed the Holy Spirit to give him probably. And who knows what could have happened, what might have happened had he gone in there under the divine direction of the Holy Spirit and allowing the Holy Spirit to use him and put the words in his mouth that he needed to speak, can you imagine what would have happened if all of the most intelligent people in the world would have got, come under conviction because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit on the Apostle Paul and they gotten saved? Can you imagine what the world would be like today should that have happened? But in, anyway, that's shoulda, coulda, woulda, doesn't really work. But anyway, he... He's, he's a different man now. Verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. See, he didn't do that at Mars Hill. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I don't know about you, but if you... I would underline that in my Bible. I've got it underlined. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them which are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor are the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom of God, ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for they had they known it, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory underscore that or just put parentheses around that eighth verse because i'm going to talk about that uh, and i'll spend some time there but as it is written i have not seen nor ear heard neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which god has prepared for them that love him 
But God has revealed them. Here we go. But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. Everybody say that's the Holy Ghost. But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. In other words, if there's an answer, if there is a remedy, if there is something that needs to be done to bring about your healing, your deliverance, your breakthrough, your kingdom connection. It says if you will keep the faith, the Holy Spirit will go on a search for that and it will, while he's searching for where it is, the Holy Ghost is going to cause a kingdom connection on the inside of you and bring source and need together. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's why you need the Holy Ghost. That's why you need to walk in the Holy Ghost. That's why you need to pray in the Holy Ghost. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all. We need that anointing on our life. And I'll, I'll say this several times, whatever how long it takes me to get through this, this message here. But as long as you're praying in your own tongue, in your own English language, you're praying with your own understanding. You're praying with your own human reasoning. You're praying with your own logic. You're praying with your own experiences. You're praying with what you know. Are you following me? Now, that's no, there's nothing wrong with praying prayers that are backed up by the Word of God. But there comes a time and a point when you need to realize there is a source on the inside of you that is greater than your experiences, greater than your knowledge, because every one of us have gone through some things that we're facing at the moment that our past experiences can't help us with. Our knowledge doesn't help us find a, an answer. Our, you know, our, what we've been through doesn't give us, you know, the advice that we need to come out of it. So what do we need? We need the Holy Spirit in our lives to move. So we need to pray in the Holy Spirit. We need to understand that, and I'll get to this, and you'll hear me say this several times, so I'm going to be redundant about a lot of things. Roman 8, 26, how be it, there will be times in your life when you don't know what to pray in your human flesh. Your human flesh doesn't understand what you're going through, doesn't understand why you're going through it, doesn't understand why it's got to happen right now. And because of that, anxiety comes in and you get in desperation. God loves it when his children get desperate for him to move because they will exercise a kind of faith that they don't normally exercise because they're desperate and they're calling on God because they believe in God and they're putting their trust in him. Are you with me? So, how be it, we know not what to pray for as we ought, but the Holy Spirit Himself. Everybody say, Himself. That's, that's the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity. He is not an it. He is a person. He is, He has characteristics. He can be grieved. He can be quenched. He can speak through you. He can move. He will hear from His Father and He will show it to us. He is a person living on the inside of you. I don't understand that. Now, I don't understand this. Everybody in this world that has any intelligence at all believes that a person can be demon-possessed, don't they? I mean, Hollywood makes more movies every year about demon-possessed people doing wreaking havoc on the world, and we don't have a problem with that. Well, that's a wild man. That man's full of, what do they say, full of the what? Devil. Okay, if, if, if people can believe that an individual can be full of the devil, why is it so hard for us to believe that we can be full of God? That's pretty good stuff, isn't it? I mean, you see, the devil doesn't want you to see that side. They're fanatics. They get up there and shout. Well, look at a person that's demon-possessed. We see a person wild doing all kind of, cra out, in the, out in public doing all kind of crazy things. We know automatically that person is full of the devil. You know? I don't want nothing to do with that person. But, you know, at, at the same respect, they don't believe, they don't understand why we believe that the Holy Spirit, God, can possess the characteristics of an individual to do good, to have supernatural powers, to have supernatural experiences. Just the devil, we see, we see Hollywood printing all these, you know, people get full of the devil and they can pick up a train and throw it, you know. All kind of, you know, you shoot it with a gun ten times and they're still coming at you, you know, with a butcher knife in their hand, going to cut your head off. I mean, we, we have all this painted in front of us, but you start talking about the deity of God. 
You start talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul said, I came to you not in excellency of speech, but in the power and in the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Okay. Where was I? Y'all supposed to be keeping that with me. Verse 10, thank you. Uh, no, let me go back to verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor heard, neither has it entered the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man, which of a man, save the Spirit of man, in which is, it, is in it. In other words, you don't know what I'm thinking. You don't have a clue what I'm thinking right now. I don't have a clue what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, well, where's he, where's he going with this? You know, here's the deal. I don't know what you're thinking, what I'm thinking, but because the Holy Spirit is living on the inside of me, he knows sometimes I, when I'm thinking the wrong thing and he'll correct me. He'll restrain you from such stuff. You ever been restrained by the Holy Spirit? Have you ever been pushed forward by the Holy Spirit? That's the funny thing. When he restrains me, I don't, when I, I don't want to be restrained. When he's pushing me forward, I don't want to be pushed forward. We, we can't seem to get it, get, get it together. Okay, I can anyway. Maybe you're better than I am. I don't know. For what man knoweth the... Th verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. Did you hear that? So what we receive is not of this world. This word that I'm reading is not of this world. If it were, it wouldn't be any different than Mark Twain's, Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer, you know? The word of God is not of this world. It's from God. It's supernatural. Did you, the word of God is alive. You can speak the word of God over your life now and it can cause something to come to pass 10 years from now. You hear what I'm saying? It will not return void. If it's spoken in faith, it will not come back empty. It will accomplish why it was spoken to begin with out of faith. And when you speak faith-filled words, according to what thus saith the word of God, God is as good as his word. He has to stand behind the word that you are believing him for, that he spoke to begin with, and you're speaking it now out of your mouth by faith because you believe nothing is impossible with God. And by helping you here. So the Word of God is supernatural. It's powerful. It's beyond nature. It defies nature. Nature cannot explain a miracle. Amen. It is the opposite of, of nature. Amen. Now we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now, when I read this, I'm going to stop for there, for right there. When I read this, let me tell you what I know the devil is all about. The devil is all about making all of us from one time or the other think that they're right. You may, I think one of the greatest lies that Satan ever, has ever convinced us of and sold us is that there is an expiration date on your miracle. That things have gone far now and it's too late now for you to expect a turnaround from God. I think Satan has sold that bill of goods so successfully, so often to so many people. But I think what Paul is telling us here, and I'll get to it in just a moment in verse 10, you're not out of options. When you Next time you hit a stump and something is going wrong and you know immediately this is the work of Satan. This is, this is de the devil dealing up something in my life to discourage me. Remember Sunday night I told you the devil doesn't want your car. He's not going to get up in the morning and drive to work. He doesn't want your job. He's not going to punch a time clock in the morning. Listen, he doesn't want your house. The de listen, the devil wants to tear your car up, tear your nerves up because your car is tore up. He wants the boss man to ride your back all week long. He, listen, the devil is not going to go to work in your place. 
Satan wants the house to be broken down. He wants the children to come up with all kind of fees that you got to pay now that school's in session and you've been planning on that. you got just enough. you you got just enough money to last the month. But Satan, when he gets through, you got more month than you have money. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Satan doesn't want your job, your car, your house. He doesn't, he doesn't want your children's education. Satan wants to get on your nerves. Satan wants to tear you out of the frame so that you won't trust God. And he wants you to think, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm out of options here. I don't have a choice. I might as well do what you know, I've been told to do. Listen, you're not, God doesn't predestine any of us. And I tell myself, I'm not predestined to fail. I have been predestined to win. You can't go under as a child of God for going over. God's anointed word will hold you up regardless of the storm that you're in, regardless of what you're facing, regardless of what you're going through. God is, God is able. I, I, the Lord gave me this this week, and I, I, I tell you what, I... I just like to collapse. I like to have a fit. God is able to give you unrealistic moments. You ever have one of those? Praise God. Unrealistic moments. Well, what is that? People wouldn't believe it if you told them. They wouldn't believe it. You, you know, you, you start talking about God and they said, oh, I don't believe that. People nowadays know that God is a God of miracles. People, you know, it's too easy. People got collateral, they'll just go to the bank. Why not pray for mailbox money? <laughs> I mean, you know, I know you don't play the lottery, so why not just why not just pray that just God will just bless you because you've been good to somebody else? The Bible says, "Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will mend, will God add to your bosom because as much as you give, God will measure that and give it back to you." You know what that means in carnal language? It means God says, "I saw what you did, and I'll be a debtor to no man." I'm not going to be a debtor to you. I see every time you do something good, and every time you do something good, I'm taking dough of it, and I'm going to bless you. Your life won't always be the way it is when you're going through a mess. It just feels that way, doesn't it? Every time you go through a storm, you say, this is the worst storm I've ever had. Every time you have a problem, this is the worst problem i ever had. Well, that's what Satan wants you to think. You're, you're not going to always have the problem that you've got right now. As soon as you make up your mind, I'm not going to stop serving God just because of this little bitty thing. You know? Satan is going to hit you with the best that he has. But when he finds out that you are going to be relentless in your walk with God, he's going to understand, I can't do nothing with him. You know, God, Job, Jesus, Pete, Satan. You think it's easy? You get up here. I don't know every name in the Bible, but I thought I was going to have to name them all before I got there. <laughs> Satan said to Jesus, or God, I can't touch him. You got a fence around him. He's your boy. He's your son. He's your child. I take that personal. If God is not a respecter of person, if I, if I shoot evil, if I walk uprightly before the Lord, God's got a fence around me. The only way that fence comes down is if I lower the standards in my relationship with God and refuse to live in righteousness and holiness. As long as I'm living according to God's word, I can expect unrealistic moments in my life. Amen, somebody? It can happen because God's God. I mean, he's just God. And he's a big God. I, I, one of my favorite scriptures, and I'd use it every day. Ask anything in my name, and I'll do it. That's pretty good stuff. And then you flip over to Ephesians chapter 3. He says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we're able to ask or think according to the power that works within us. That's some big stuff. That's heavy duty, folks. I mean, that's, that's unrealistic moments. No, there's nothing coming forward in my life that God can't handle. Now, I want you to write this down. When faith is a lifestyle that you live, it is also going to be a reflex. When faith is a lifestyle, it's going to be a reflex. 
When Satan hits you with this because faith is, your life, is a lifestyle that you live, automatically you're going to be like, Jesus, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written. Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written. It is written, it is written, it is written. When, when, whenever Satan starts attacking you with stuff that you didn't expect, faith ought to be a reflex that you come back, you retaliate with Satan's attack with the Word of God, with the promises of God, with a healing scripture from God, with a deliverance scripture from God, with a storm-stopping verse from God, with a, with a, with a, with a revival anointing from God. You see, when faith is our reflex, it'll be the guiding principle of our life that brings us to trusting God for every circumstance. And if you trust God for every circumstance in your life, peace is going to be your virtue. If you, listen, listen to me. You need to hear this because a lot of times they say, well, I'm trusting God. We don't have peace. Well, something's wrong somewhere. Because he said he'd keep us in perfect peace when, his mind is, when our mind is stayed on him, Isaiah 26 and 13. If we have perfect peace, we may not like the circumstance that we're going through, but if we have perfect peace in our relationship with God and faith is our natural reflex, here comes a trouble. All of a sudden we said, okay, God, you said. All right, God, I'm trusting you. All right, God, I'm not going to lose sleep over this. God, this is beyond me and I'm your child and you promised me that you'd never leave me nor forsake me. God, you're here with me in this situation. I don't know how you're going to do this, but I already know what the outcome is going to be. I already win before the battle's ever begun because greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved us. You see, peace is going to be your virtue. If you trust God in every circumstance in your life, you're not going to bite your nails off till quick. You're not going to worry yourself sitting in a rocking chair waiting for something to happen, someone to call, somebody to give you an assurance. Listen, your assurance is in God. God is your source. Don't ever forget that. God is your source. Not who writes your paycheck. Listen, not your mama, not your daddy. I know they brought you in this world, and I know they love you. Nobody can love you like mama can. But God is your source. God always has been your source. We live and we move and we have our being through Christ Jesus, the Bible said. He, he's your source. If you don't have Him, you're out of here, man. If you don't have God, you're going to stop breathing any moment now. Amen. God has already strategized. Everybody say strategized. I kind of like that word right now. This is about, God's already strategized for your victory. Did you know before you were even born, God decided what path you would walk on and he knew that there would be this over here and while you're headed that way, he's, I think I'm just going to, I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to allow the devil to bring a circumstance into your life and my strategy is going to be not just for you to be delivered, but I want the world to see my delivering power by bringing you out. So I'm going to strategize Satan. Let me tell you something, and I'm going to preach this pretty soon. Satan has you right where God wants you. Because Satan is play, playing right into God's hands. Satan is creating this warfare, and he's causing all kinds of smoke screens. I'm staying with my text, by the way, because I'll prove this in a few moments, where it says, if the enemy had known who Jesus would, was, they would have never allowed him to be crucified. Satan doesn't know everything. He just knows how he's going to attack you. He knows your weakness because he's been making you, he's been studying you. He's been watching what you watch. He's been watching where you're going. He's been watching who you're talking to. He's been watching what causes you to look a second time. Satan knows everything about you before he even pull, you know, reaches into his quiver and pulls out the arrow and sticks it in whatever he's going to stick it in to, to basically poison your life with sorrow. Satan knows how to do all that. But I'll tell you something. God knows how to strategize your victory. And in doing so, there's nothing he likes more than for the church to dance on the devil's head. Praise God. He wants us to rejoice. God wants us to walk in victory. God wants us to be able to scale the mountain. David said, the Lord has helped me to run through a troop. You know what that means? He says, he's helped me to fight an army. He said, I had to fight off an army. He's caused me to leap over a wall. When I was hemmed in, I couldn't get out. Every way I looked, I was trapped. I couldn't get out. But the Lord gave me the strength to get over that wall. And then, lo and behold, as soon as I got over the wall, there was a mountain. He said, he gave me, he gave me feet like a deer that I could scale the mountain like it wasn't even there. God has already strategized 
your victory. Before you were even born, God had already strategized your victory. I'll say this later on. I'm going to say it now because it's on my mind. And I might not say it later on. I might forget it because you might get to get me excited and I get to go somewhere else. Did you know that salvation plan was in place before there was even a human being on this place? Do you understand that salvation was in, pl in place before sin had ever been offered up in this world? Do you understand how far God is ahead of your problem? Before He ever put Adam and Eve in the garden, He already had an answer to their failure. Before man ever made a mistake, God already had an atonement worked out for them. He said, no, I wasn't planning on this. You know, I just don't know, Adam. You, you know, you're a disappointment to me. I've made you my image. I've given you my power. Man, I can just, I can sit on my celestial throne in heaven and I can think a thought toward you and you understand it. And now you've done this. What am I going to do now? God already had atonement figured out before Adam fell. So you're sitting there worrying about what's going on and God already had it figured out. You've got to rest in God. You've got to just let Jesus, and I don't like this song because, you know, why, why just let him take the wheel when you had a problem? For years and years and years, this, this sign, I never understood, God is my co-pilot. Well, if he's going to be on board, I want him to fly this thing. <laughs> why in the world do I want Alpha and Omega sitting over there in, in the luxury seat? Get up and get over here and fly this plane because you can, you can fly me through a storm. Is God in control of your life or not? You see, when faith, when faith is in your life, every time circumstance comes up, it'll be a natural reflex. You'll go direct, directly to God and say, Now, God, you said now, God, you promised. You'll go back and you'll remember when a prophecy was given to you. How many have ever done that? Go through something and it's contrary to what God told you. Read the Bible. While you're reading the Bible, Holy Spirit confirms something in your spirit. You know it's God. And now you're going through something contrary to what you read and the Holy Spirit affirmed it in your spirit while you were reading it. And you, immediately when you start going through that thing, you can use it all of a sudden. The Holy Ghost says, remember what you guys said? Remember the word. Remember when you read that in the Bible? Holy Ghost does that all the time. Holy Ghost tells me, remember when you read that? Remember when you were, you know, one night and you was looking for an answer and you read that? And you didn't know why you was reading that when you was looking for something else? Well, you, was, you read that then because you was going to need it now! God always looks ahead. God always sees what you're going to face down the road and He strategizes. He's going to defeat the devil. Now, in the Old Testament, when you defeated a king, you see, Satan is the prince of this world. In the Old Testament, when you defeated a prince, not only did you get the honor of being a hero, but you got to take his stuff from him. You took his stuff home with you. Amen. How would you like to get back everything the thief has stolen from you? Praise God. Amen. God has already got an escape plan, whatever you're dealing with. Whatever you're dealing with. Before, before you even born, God saw this day. If you're going through a storm right now, if you're going through a situation, if you're going through a situation right now where you need God to intervene, God, before you even born, God saw this coming. And he's there. The hardest thing it is for us to believe, and I don't know why it is, but it is. The hardest thing it is for us to believe is that when we're going through a storm, God's 100 miles away. We believe that. We, don't, we can't believe. We can't believe that he's right here with us. We, the devil thinks, well, God must not be with you. If he was, you wouldn't be going through all this. That devil sent the storm to begin with. He can't tell the truth for telling a lie. The reason you're going through the storm is because the devil sent the storm. Amen, somebody. And what we need to remember is, when I'm going through the storm, if he has promised me that he will never leave me nor forsake me, why can't we remember that when I'm going through a storm? If I'm going through a storm, and if Jesus is going through that storm with me, I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Amen. If I'm going through a storm and he never leaves me, I don't think there's a storm that can take Jesus out. And I just don't believe because of John 3, 16, and I'll quote it tonight, praise God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. God is not going to say, son, Johnny, you've got to make it on your own. I've got to get out of here. God doesn't take me in a storm to leave me there. He is with me to the end. He said, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Praise God. Healing was in place before there was a sickness. Glory to God. Amen. I said amen. amen. First Corinthians 2 and 8, look at it. But if this world had understood it, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. I, I, I had to write this down. God has hid his plan from my enemy. God's hid his plan. Satan doesn't know what God is up to. The first sermon I preached here was God's secrets. You may remember that. First sermon I preached here. God's secrets. I preached about David. For 40 days and 40 nights, a nine feet, nine inch giant terrorized the people of God. The king was at a drunken stupor and was afraid to come out of the tent. Evil spirits drove him delirious. He was a madman. Stuck on alcohol. The stronger it is, the better. He just, just knocked me out. I don't want to hear that giant anymore. Amen? But every time he'd sober up, he could hear him roaring in. Goliath all but had Israel whipped. It was his for the taking. Forty days. It's the number of trials. the number of judgment. Number test. For 40 days he came out every morning and every evening and he taunted and he blasphemed God and the children of Israel and its leaders and the word, the promises of God. 40 days. He had them in his hand. He never even knew that on the backside of a field was a shepherd boy that had been playing with the Bedouins, the shepherds of that area, who could take a slingshot and knock a pigeon out of the air in full flight with a slingshot. He never knew that David existed. And I want you to know, I believe with all my heart, if you're a praying warrior, if you are a Bible-reading person, if you hold on to the Word of God, if you are full of the Holy Ghost and you're waiting for your next mission, I want you to know you're the greatest secret that God's got on this planet in Franklin County and God's about to use you to knock Goliath out. There are some things that Satan just doesn't even know exist and you're one of them. And you need, listen, you need to straighten up your shoulders and just get a smile on your face and a spring in your step. And you need to realize I'm not some down on, the, on my mouth person. I am full of the Holy Ghost. And look, your, your enemy, your enemy is no match to the word of God that's in you, to the blood of Jesus that's got you covered, and to the Holy Ghost that's filling you with power and authority from on high. Satan is no match for you. I have read in my Bible where it says one believer can put a thousand demons into flight. Hello? I, I may be foolish here, but I don't believe the devil's got a thousand devils in Franklin County. Amen? He may have. Two can put 10,000. Can you imagine what this church could do if just two people would start binding together and praying and pleading the, Holy, pleading the blood of Jesus and letting the Holy Spirit just move in their lives with the, with the, with the anointing of God? Can you imagine what we could do? Can you imagine the strongholds that could be pulled down? Can you imagine the Holy Ghost anointing that we can smear on this county and see a deliverance of God and see drugs run out of this county and children be delivered from alcohol and drugs and, and all kinds of things? Before there was a failure, God had salvation in place. It's amazing to me how many millions of years Lucifer spent in eternity with God and never knew about the salvation plan. I mean, he's God's personal minister. There's some things that everybody doesn't need to know. If God kept that from Lucifer, who was an archangel, if God kept that from one of the most powerful created beings God ever made, if God can keep that from him, and yet... Bestow it on us. Satan never knew. He knew 
according to Genesis 3, that someone was coming. He knew that God required a blood sacrifice. He is a genius in so many things in deception. But he was an absolute dumbfounded, ignorant person when it came to understanding that every sheep, every goat, every oxen, every sacrifice that was ever offered up in the Old Testament was a metaphor. It was a shadow of something better that was coming and he never really put it together that that shadow, that metaphor, that goat, that ram that was slain on Yom Kippur, on the Passover, he never understood in, in, down in Goshen in Egypt when God told Moses, tell them to, I want them to take a spotless lamb and, and don't prepare it like the Egyptians do. I want you to cook it over an open fire, catch the blood, and put a cross above the doorpost for tonight at midnight the death angel is passing over and when I see the blood, death won't come in but it will pass over you. He couldn't even put that together. If he had known that Jesus Jesus Christ was coming to die on the cross for our sins, the Bible said they would have never allowed him to be put to death. So I'm telling you, Satan doesn't know what power lies within you that has been reserved since the time you became a conception in your mother's womb. There was placed an anointing on the inside of you that Satan just can't handle. He doesn't even know about. There are some secrets. Well, how do you know that? Because Psalms says, He will hide me in a secret place. In the pavilion of God, there He will cause me to have peace. Listen to me. God has an anointing for your life that the devil doesn't even know. Amen, somebody? There's no problem in front of me that God doesn't have an answer for. Look at verse 9. I have not seen, nor ear heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for them that love Him. There's a lot of ways I can go with this. But the best way I can do it is this. God has kept that special anointing for your deliverance for the right timing in your life. Now, I don't know if you're like me. Some of you are probably worse. I've told God a lot of times, God, if you're going to deliver, you need to deliver now. They say the shortest prayer in, in uh, Guinness's World Book of Records was written or was prayed by a black man who was sitting on his back porch in Gainesville, Georgia, when the hurricane came through in, in, in the 1940s. He looked up and he prayed the prayer, oh God, if you can't come quick, don't come. <laughs> that's, that's in the Guinness's World Book of Records. <laughs> You know, and I've told God, God, if you're going to do it, you better do it now. I know this thing's bad, Lord. Just like God doesn't, like God is not sitting in the seat that I'm sitting in, and He doesn't see what I'm seeing, and He doesn't know what I I, I know is about to happen. I'm trying to convince God. Okay, God, you need to, you need to give me some of that miracle, some of that anointing, that is mine. Amen. Somebody. God will allow your enemy to walk right into his strategy. And, and while, if, if you're not careful, you're thinking, I'm trapped. And Satan says, I got you now. But God is just, said, everything is coming together just like I planned it. I'm about to get glory out of this. I'm about to move. I don't, never mind the fact that Johnny doesn't have all the faith he needs. I love him and he's mine. And never mind the fact that he might be part of the cause he's going through that, but I, I finally got Satan right where I need him for that area right there. The, that area is about to see my glory, and I'm going to move in Johnny's life to show this world that it's never too late to trust God for a miracle. You see what I'm saying? I'm using me because I'm the best example I got. Amen? When God is finished, he's going to have things right the way he planned. God does things on purpose for your good. Now, if you'll be honest with me, none of you always enjoy everything God's doing in your life. <clears throat> one of the worst spankings I ever got in my life, and I probably got more than all of you collected in this room. <laughs> my daddy would always say, son, this is going to hurt me worse than it does you. And I was always kind of a quick-witted person and it always got me in trouble. 
My daddy told me that one day, and I said, well, how come you act like you enjoy it so much? I felt like a terrapin turtle. He wasn't going to let me go till it thundered, and I was praying, oh, God. I was praying for the rapture. I was praying for anything, you know, but um, God does things on purpose for our good, and he does that because he loves us. The Bible says this, and it's hard to explain. The Bible says, him that the Lord loves, he gives him a whipping. Didn't you say that? It, well, King James says, he that the Lord loves, he chastises B times. He chastises. He whips the person. He disciplines. Let me do it that way. He disciplines the people that he loves. Discipline is something that you've got to come under if you're going to have God's favor in your life. You've got to let God set you straight sometimes. Paul did. Paul said, I die daily. You know, the Lord is going to require you to look in the mirror and, and make sure that there's not some things. I think Jesus did it best when he talked about the Father and the Holy Spirit and, and himself working in our lives as individuals. He says, my Father is the husbandman. I am the vine and you are the branches. And then he says this. This is the heart hurting part. Every branch in me that does not bring fruit forth fruit he will purge it, cut the tip of it off, see if there's something wrong there. And then if it still doesn't bring forth fruit, he'll cut it down and throw it in the fire because a fruitless tree has no value in the kingdom of God. Now let me close with this. I know when you're finished. There's a story in the Bible, the book of Mark, where the sower went out to sow. And when he sowed, he came in that evening put everything up in the barn and went into his house. The next morning, his servants came knocking on the door and says, Master, while you were sleeping, someone, the enemy, came and he sowed tares among the wheat. You want us to go dig them out? He said, no. Now, I've got to be honest with you. I probably spent about 30 years of my ministry without understanding the real reason. He said, don't do it. Because I remember growing up when we had a garden or cotton or whatever, if you didn't get the crabgrass out or the nut you know, grass they called it, if you didn't get Johnson grass, man, it'll take over and you, have, you won't be able to find the cotton. You've got to get it out. But what the King James Version doesn't tell you and what you will never know unless you do research on this is this. When tares are growing up among the wheat, it looks just like the wheat stalk. It looks exactly like the wheat stalk. And the farmer says, don't go out there and start digging up weeds because I can't afford you to dig up my wheat. It's not, those tear, listen, those tear are there. <clears throat> but in the end, the wheat is a stronger plant because it will bear fruit. I never knew this. Did you know that tares cannot produce fruit? He said, you can't tell the difference right now between wheat and tares, but you will be able to tell the difference when harvest time comes because wheat will have wheat seeds on it. You see, we're living in a world when it's hard to know nowadays. It's easy to confess Christianity nowadays because it's popular. Everybody's a Christian, okay? But there's only one way. There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is the way of death. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We need to understand. The Apostle Paul is telling us you're going to go through some stuff. Now, later on, next Wednesday night, I want to get to where the Holy Spirit's role is in our lives if he is predominantly in charge of our lives. And that, my friend, is up to me and it's up to you. How will we yield our members to the Holy Spirit. Let's stand together, please. Heavenly Father, I love you tonight, and I'm so very, very thankful for the Word of God and the power that it has and the effect that it has on our lives when we receive it with meekness. God, I thank you for the anointing that I've received tonight. I thank you for everybody that is here. 
I ask you now in the name of Jesus that you will move upon all of us, that we will be endued with power from on high. You told us in your word, and you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall become witnesses unto me. God, help us to have that endowment. Help us to have that fulfillment of the power of the Holy Spirit moving and operating in our lives so that we can ventricolate through this world and we can be a living, vibrant testimony to a gang-saying, backbiting, unbelieving world and show them that Jesus Christ is Lord of this world. We ask these things tonight. Go with us as we leave here. Give us a great week. Anoint every person here. Watch over them with your guiding hand and spirit. Bring them back at the appointed time. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. Let me remind you, we're not going to have a sign-up sheet just because of secrecy. We want Sister Dorothy.